Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for the download, and hopefully what you're about to hear is another upload of consciousness-enhancing audio, because we have a really cool chat coming up with Jonica Stuckey. Jonica is a mystic poet, performer, and the founding editor of the award-winning press Black Ocean, and he is here to talk about his latest book of poetry, Ascend, Ascend, recently released by Jack White's publishing imprint, Third Man Books. Ascend to Send was written over the course of 20 days, coming in and out of trance states brought on by intermittent fasting and somatic rituals, while Jonica secluded himself in the tower of a 100-year-old church. The book is rooted in the Jewish mystical tradition of Merkaba literature, chronicling an ascent up the Kabbalistic Sephirot. Jonica noted in his description of the book that traditional Merkaba prose tends to be rather dry and focused on preparations for the journey while sort of avoiding descriptions of the experience itself. But Ascend Ascend, I think, skirts that norm and Jonica instead has chosen to document his entire journey, which he describes as the ecstatic destruction of the self. It's something firmly in my wheelhouse and I hope after an hour or so with Jonica that it's firmly in yours as well. There is a 25-minute Patreon extension with him and more on that after the chat, but for now, let's sit back, relax, and let Jonica lay some icky thump on us with what Vice recently called his doom metal mysticism. Enjoy. Jonica Stuckey, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate your time, and I'm really excited to have you here, although I think a better word might be ecstatic. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. I'm... I'm excited too. I save my, I save my ecstasies for my poetry, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. Although actually, no, I don't, I don't write poetry, but I do have a creative writing background and I did take a couple cool. poetry classes in college. Yeah. And it was always like, to me, I was never good at it because I think I, I was treating all of my poems that I wrote for the classes as like hip hop verse because I was <laughs> listening to a lot of hip hop. And then I realized, well, I mean, that is poetry in a sense, but it's not like poetry that we'll be talking about here today. But I am curious, you know, when did you first, I guess, discover your interest in this medium? Because it's very underappreciated and undervalued in terms of art. Yeah, well, my involvement with poetry has been more or less lifelong. The only, I guess, practice I've been involved with longer than poetry would actually be mysticism, which I'm sure we'll get to in a minute. But I, you know, started writing poetry probably like a lot of people do when I was, I don't know, in elementary school as an exercise or something. But by the time I was, uh, I would say like 14, I was writing it with some pretty serious intent. And I was lucky enough to have some parents who really believed in the value of art and creative action and cultivated that interest in me by introducing me to a poet friend of theirs who was published and he sort of mentored me early on in eighth and ninth grade and gave me reading assignments and would take me on walks in the woods where we would read poetry out loud to the geese and the trees and it was a great early education and and through that I really developed not just a love for poetry but I think specifically an appreciation for the magical power of language as a as a material as a tool and and speaking it as an out loud art yeah and i think that's what i like about hip hop you know i'm just going to draw it back to that because that's like my own personal sort of grounding in this style i guess but mm -hmm. yeah i do like spoken word and and spoken rhyme and performance which i know we'll talk about here too but you said that mysticism was something that you have been involved in longer than poetry. Take us through your more mystical background. You know, I know you were raised Jewish. I assume that's what you're talking about. Well, actually, so I, my um, mother's side of the family is Jewish. And, you know, from a cultural perspective, that was a big part of my upbringing and still is a big part of my family life. But it really was more of a cultural Jewish upbringing than a religious Jewish upbringing. And that family, I guess, would identify themselves as Reformed Jews if they identified at all in terms of a denomination. But really, they were like progressive, 
civil rights Jews involved in the civil rights movements in the 60s, socialists, anarchists, you know, New England Jews. Um, but my yeah. parents met while following a guru around the world. Um, and they were sort of on tour with him. And then they were married by him. They lived in India for a while. They left India for France, where they opened their own meditation center and ran that briefly. And then when my mom got pregnant, they moved back to the United States. And then after I was born, we lived in a series of ashrams in Oakland and Miami and upstate New York. And so from probably as early as, early as I could walk or sooner... <laughs> Earlier, I was like sitting in my dad's lap during these big group meditation exercises, attending chants with hundreds of people in these large meditation halls, and kind of going from there. So I uh, affectionately refer to myself as a Hindu growing up, growing up between those two traditions. Um, but even beyond that, outside of the ashram, whenever we were on vacation, traveling somewhere, or some sort of holy person, mystical person was in the vicinity, you know, within a day's drive, my parents would take me to see that person. So that was like a, a Sufi in Philadelphia or, you know, any one of a number of sort of independent gurus, whether they were Hindu aligned or not, a lama, a psychic surgeon, like you name it, we probably went there at one point or another. So some of them were charlatans, and some of them, I think, were genuinely wise and profound individuals. Yeah, that's interesting. So you have a lot of, in addition to Judaism, you have a lot of like Eastern mysticism maybe kind of baked into your worldview? Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I would say, the, and in fact, probably more Eastern mysticism in terms of my early upbringing, and it wasn't until later on in adulthood that I reconciled the progressive politics of my Jewish family with what I think is actually a, a deep Jewish mystical teaching in Kabbalah, and then kind of was able to circle that back around to my more Eastern upbringing as well. Could you tell us a little bit about how you did that then? Like, how did you reconcile <laughs> that? Did you see uh, similarities in the systems or what? Well, I think it, it really started a few years ago where my wife, then fiance, was taking intro to Judaism class, and I decided to take that with her. She was not raised Jewish, but wanted to convert. So I had never, you know, I wasn't mitzvahed. I had never formally studied Judaism, and I took this class with her, and it was really eye-opening for me to... I always just thought it was my family that was this quirky Jewish family who would have like fundraisers for the Black Panthers or demonstrate for Sacco and Vanzetti or something like that. But I learned that that wasn't just my family, that there was this tradition in modern or contemporary American Judaism that was very civil rights minded and that that was an extension of this Jewish teaching of Tikkun Olam which is repairing the world. And in Jewish, mainstream Jewish religion, it kind of ends there. But then as I went deeper outside of that class into Jewish studies, understanding that that teaching relates deeply to this Kabbalistic understanding of this broken vessel and the withdrawing of the essence of God and that you know, the reality is this broken vessel that we're repairing and sort of trying to bring this divine essence back into it. And you can repair that through cultivation of the self as well as cultivation of the world around you. So that, that was sort of like a, a newer learning and understanding for me over the last few years. But it ties it to the previous 35 odd years of my life prior to that. And really understanding that the redemption of the self goes hand in hand with the redemption of the world. And that's a Vedic teaching that's in various Gitas and Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, that there's this, through the perfection of the individual, you perfect, you perfect the world around the individual. And so that, that new understanding of the Jewish mystical tradition 
resonated deeply with my more Eastern religious upbringing. And that was exciting to me because, you know, it felt, it felt like a reconnection with my heritage in a, in a really meaningful way, as well as a way to start exploring what a contemporary Jewish mystical tradition might look like in art and what a contemporary Jewish poetry would look like as a, as a now a published poet. Because my mystical center has always been tied to my creative process as well. Well, that's what I was going to ask next was like where these two interests sort of intersect or overlap. I mean, obviously your latest book that you publish, Ascend to Send, is, is rooted in this Jewish mystical structure here. But I am curious, like if you went back in your own journey, like if you could pinpoint a time when you really did start to merge those two, you know, sort of seemingly disparate parts of yourself into this this vehicle now that you're using. Yeah. I would say it it started for me about probably 15 years ago when I was working on my master's thesis in poetry. My thesis was it was called something like a cloud and its shadow poetry as meditation or meditation as poetry or something like that. But the gist of it was that I had started playing around with different ways of writing from meditative states during my graduate work. And, you know, and I had taken some classes in cultural criticism and I started feeling like that the creative act and and the output of the creative act, the art, the poem was a way that we could bring something from the substrata to sort of borrow a quantum physical term from the substrata into the strata that then serves as a map for the audience to go back into the substrata. Or another way to phrase it would be if I can put myself into a meditative or ecstatic state or a trance state during the creative act, and I'm able to successfully through the craft of my art, capture that. And that could be in a poem or it could be in a song or a painting or a sculpture that then that artwork becomes a vessel for that energy and for that state of consciousness. And the audience can then find their way back into that state of consciousness through the art itself. That was sort of the proposal I put forth and supported through, you know, various other philosophical theories, as well as some really interesting neurological studies about brainwave activity, both in the creative state and when we are exposed to art. And I think from that point onward, I really started thinking about poetry as this, having this potential for, you know, poetry as a mystical experience in and of itself, that in a certain way, religion then becomes a genre of art. Hmm, that's an interesting, I don't know, angle into that. Yeah, I've not really considered religion as a genre of art, but I can sort of see that now. You know, it kind of goes on from there. I think it, if then to sort of extend it several years later, you know, this is probably about 10 years ago and uh, maybe 11 years ago, 2008 or 2009, there's this challenge called National Poetry Writing Month in the month of April. And people who want to participate you commit to writing a poem a day every day for the 30 days of April. I had never done this before, and, I, and I'm not a prolific poet, typically. So the idea of writing 30 poems in 30 days was very daunting to me when I normally would write maybe like 12 poems a year or something like that. So I actually turned to a novelist friend of mine who was who was very prolific, and I asked him what the secret was to churning out thousands of words a day like he did. And he told me, oh, well, you got to create a ritual for yourself. And, you know, in hindsight, what he meant, obviously, was just a routine, <laughs> right? That mm -hmm. yeah. you get up at 7 a.m., you make your coffee, then you write for two hours, and then you eat, and then you go for a walk, and then, you know, whatever it is, whatever your writing ritual is. But because of my background, I took him very literally and, you know, sort of my neurons fired like, yeah, ritual. I love ritual. <laughs> so I developed a very, you know, like esoteric influenced ritual for myself that involved 
incense and drone and meditation and candlelight and trance states and even like a very specific drink I would pour myself every time and not enough to, you know, get actually inebriated, but it was like a somatic trigger for inner intoxication. So I did this and and I started writing from that place every day for these 30 days. And the tenor of my poetry changed dramatically. And I was writing poems in a voice that I had never written prior to that in decades prior to that. So that was really interesting to me. And I also thought it was the best stuff I had written up until that time. And I've kind of never looked back. And I've and ever since then, I've always used that as a place to write from that very intentionally go into a meditative or trance-like state and play. I can play with the ritual and do different things, but the idea is always to get into that liminal state of consciousness where I'm becoming unattached from my body and unattached from the ego. And there's a kind of um, beatification, I think, that comes from that state. And the work itself, not to sound precious, but feels very otherworldly inspired from that place. Yeah, and your poetry specifically has a, a couple of different of, let's call them like tags here, or, or genre descriptors maybe. One of them that we've sort of been talking around, I want to just maybe define more directly, is this term ecstatic poetry, because it's it's not something that I'm too familiar with. I mean, I know what it is, but I haven't really read a lot of it, or I guess experienced a lot of it, but I've been knee deep in your work for a couple of weeks now, and damn, like this is the most ecstatic I've felt when I've been reading poetry, I guess. <laughs> First of all, thank you for saying that. It's been an interesting, you know, you talked about the, I liked how you said different tags for poetry, the, the metadata for my writing. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> and I mean, and that's a very real thing, actually. You know, there, there are all these online book databases, and when you're publishing a book, your editor or your publisher will ask you or hopefully will consult with you about what the metadata is for your book because that gets used not only in the Library of Congress but Amazon and you know all sorts of places. And I would say that that tag, ecstatic, is actually something that somewhere along the way someone else attached to my poetry. It's not one that I initially came up with for myself, but it is apt and I think that there's a long tradition of ecstatic poetry, um, both in Western tradition, but definitely in Eastern traditions, that that it's at root that this idea of ecstatic poetry is that the poetry becomes almost a devotional practice. It's a connection between the poet and the other, you know, that divine other, however you want to, the oversoul, <laughs> the Godhead, whatever it is. And that through that also, hopefully, that reader experiences that too. And that both of that comes from a place of longing. And so you will see romantic themes in ecstatic poetry, especially in like Sufi poetry, and actually a number of Hindu poets as well, where they talk about that other, that divine other as a lover, because that is our human metaphor for that longing to merge with this essence. And so you'll see that somewhat in this this my new book ascend ascend you'll also see a lot of that in my previous book the truth is we are perfect and i think that's actually where this where talking about my poetry as ecstatic poetry came from in my new book the the foreword is written by pam grossman i don't know if you familiar with her but yeah pam uh, is going to be on the show soon oh perfect yeah so she wrote the foreword to this new book ascend ascend and i met her because she wrote a review of my last book and got that book picked up on the ecstatic tones in that book in a way that no other reviewer had, where if you come to the book as a book of love poems, it can read just as love poems. But there is this other devotional, almost divine element to it. And, and indeed, a number of those poems in that book, I wrote as love poems to the goddess Kali, without actually explicitly naming her in any of those poems. So when I read Pam's review, I was like, this woman gets it. And we've since become friends. And when I was talking with my editor about this new book, Ascend, Ascend, and feeling like that, you know, 
for people who haven't read this book, it's a book length poem that is as this kind of maximalist, surreal, insane journey up the Kabbalistic tree of life through the four material planes and witnessing the heavenly palaces and being devoured by Leviathan angels. I mean, it's intense stuff. (laughs) And so I felt like I wanted a little context setting with the book before I just dump it on readers. And um, we were talking about maybe having someone write a foreword to it. And that's, that's why I asked Pam to do it. Uh, I couldn't imagine anyone else doing it. But yeah, and I think that's where the, this ecstatic came from. And, and you mentioned that, you know, you've been sitting with it and reading with it and having your own kind of ecstatic experiences. And it's really cool to hear. The book has only been out for a few weeks now, but I've been touring a lot behind it and I will continue to tour pretty heavily behind it. And when I perform, I sort of have two types of performances I'm doing for this book. I do these really deep, immersive, ritualistic performances that take about an hour and I perform the book in its entirety. I do it within a magic circle of my own design and we have fresh flowers and incense and beeswax candles and all these different uh, magical objects I mean, it's an immersive ritual, and I'm doing only really seven of those around the country in conjunction with the organization Atlas Obscura. But outside of those immersive rituals, even when I do a quote-unquote reading, I go back into this ecstatic trance-like state when I read the work, when I recite the work. And so the, the performances themselves are very charged, and I just did four cities this last week. I got back on Sunday. And at every one of those shows, at least one person cried <laughs> during my performance um, and came wow. up to me afterwards and you know said that like that they were just they had also entered this kind of ecstatic strange place with me, which was pretty gratifying to hear as an artist. <laughs> you know? Yeah, let me jump in and say something about that because I did get moved at points to tears during this. But let me tell you how I did though. It wasn't me reading sort of silently to myself. It's like I was reading certain passages out loud to myself because I just liked them so much. I just wanted to sort of hear the words. And that in those moments, like me hearing my own voice, I guess, or channeling something, like maybe whatever you sort of embedded into there yourself, like I was channeling that and I was just sitting here on my couch like, holy shit, like why am I so moved by this? But it's <laughs> it's a beautiful piece of art and, you know, we'll have you read some of it here later if you're up for it. But the performative aspect is something I really wanted to talk to you about because, you know, I've long thought, I guess, I don't know how long I've really thought this, but for a few years now that music was the highest form of art if you had to sort of categorize it mm-hmm. and but now i i see performance as maybe equal to or maybe even surpassing that in some way because i've realized the power of of performing in front of people of performing in yourself and being able to to channel these different aspects of whatever you're channeling i, I don't even know maybe it's channeling art with a capital a or the muse or spirit it's sort of disembodying, but not disembodying, if that makes sense, right? You're sort of inhabiting this different space within yourself that you're not really used to. And I was reading, uh, in conjunction with this, I was reading about something about performance as sort of like psychotherapeutic, if that makes sense. And yeah. it sort of kind of allows you to remove yourself directly from a situation, but still be able to process everything that's going on inside of you and around you just in a different way by sort of acting it out. And yeah. I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful, you know, and I don't know if you've heard anything like that before, but absolutely. I think that I think that performance is I mean, what did you say? Music is the highest art. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. 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 And, you know, to, to go back to one of my early statements about uh, religion being a genre of art, I'll sort of say, you know, I'll change the phrasing a little bit and say, I think performance is the highest form of magic. And that goes way back. That goes millennia back to this idea of drama theater, religion, ritual. You know, actually, one of your frequent guests, Peter Biebergall, in his latest book, Strange Frequencies, he has this great line where he says, I'm not going to quote him exactly, but whether it's the shaman or the witch or the magician, it's the performative moment 
It's in the performative moment that our consciousness is altered. Mm -hmm. and, and that I really believe as, as a poet. And that's why I, I love to tour because the writing of the work is half of, is half of it. And then the performance of it, whether I'm performing it or whether you, as you mentioned, are reading it aloud to yourself is the other half. That's the incantation. And the work has to be enacted through this lyric ritual of recitation. And then in that moment, we become our most intimate version of ourselves, or we become free or we merge with the other. And I'm so glad to hear that you did try reading it out loud and that it did affect you on that level. Pam talks about that in her foreword to my book too, is that she went out into the woods and she read the work out. And that wasn't my suggestion. She just went out there and read the book aloud to herself um, and also had this kind of mystical experience doing it. And to me, I, you know, that's not, I don't want to, like, it's easy for that to sound like, oh, my, my book's so good, it's going to do this for you. But I just think that that's, that's a hallmark of any successful work of art. I don't think that my art, that my work is exceptional in that way, but that that's the hallmark of great work. And William Blake has a line about, you know, that great art arouses the faculties to act. And that's, that's what I want to do with it. To, to bring it back to the Kabbalah for a minute, you know, Kabbalists believe that the Torah in its entirety is just one long crypto name for God, basically, that the Torah in its entirety, you don't have to read it for its literal meanings, you don't have to read it for its allegorical meanings, you can even do away with the Midrash and all the rabbinical interpretations, that just the, the language, those letters, is a, is a logos that is the name of God. And when I set out to write this book, Ascend, Ascend, I wanted to write a name for God. And I think of that, this book, this book length, wild, weird poem that has a lot of infernal <laughs> imagery in it, as well as divine imagery in it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of really um, corporal, physical body stuff going on in it. So, you know, it's not all angels and light and everything. But that this that the text in its entirety, I set out to write as a name for God, as a way to articulate this experience in its entirety. I think articulating articulating a mystical experience is a way of pronouncing a name for God. And so, of course, that's going to have some vibration, <laughs> you know, and yeah. that should be spoken. I don't. That's where I diverge from the Kabbalists. They don't think it should be. <laughs> it should be spoken aloud. It'll bring about the eschaton. And the end of the world. I think it should be spoken in, in a sense. I guess I'm reading an allegory there. It, it'll bring out the end of the self, the eschaton of the self, the death of the ego. And, and in that, we have our mystical experiences and that kind of divine. Well, while we're on the, the topic of mystical experiences, you know, tell people a little bit about the experience you had that really sort of brought you into the state to write this book. Because I know that you secluded yourself somewhere. You may have done some psychedelics as well. Uh, tell people a little bit about how you got into these trance states to write this new book of yours. Yeah. Well, before writing the book itself, the sort of seed for the book was planted years earlier in that my first and only time smoking DMT, I had a pretty incredible vision on it. And afterwards, I was describing my vision to a friend of mine. And he said, Oh, it sounds like you saw the Merkaba. And this was before I had gotten, I had sort of had this immersion in Jewish mysticism that I talked about. And so I, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with that word Merkaba. And I asked him and he said, Oh, Merkaba, that's the, that's the chariot of God, the the Jewish chariot of God that's described in Ezekiel's vision. And there's this whole tradition of Merkaba literature you should check out. So I went back and I read Ezekiel's vision and I said, yeah, that's what I saw. <laughs> like Ezekiel is describing my DMT experience. And I'll, I'll caveat and say that I think also you could describe it as a UFO abduction <laughs> or Terence McKenna's machine elves, or, mm -hmm. you know, there are a whole bunch of different cultural lenses through which to view this vision that I had, but it felt very true. And so I, I was interested, that got me 
curious about it, but I sort of backburnered it and kind of, okay, bookmark that for later exploration at some point. And then years passed and I found myself at this artist residency up in New Hampshire at a really beautiful piece of property called the Star and Snake. And it's owned and run by a couple who are artists themselves. And they bought this 100-year-old church and have turned it into an art church, a temple for creativity, really. And they run these residencies twice a year, specifically for artists in any medium who have occult or esoteric influences on their creative process. So I went up there actually not to write this book, to write a different book that was supposed to be a book-length elegiac love poem to Jean Genet. And on the eve of my departure, I lost all my notes for that other book, that Jean Genet love poem. And I'd been making notes for like two years toward writing this book. As I mentioned, I'm not a prolific poet. And the way my process works is I sort of accumulate language and fragments. And then I will seclude myself and meditate and do the go into these states and then kind of regurgitate that language that I've been accumulating as notes back into a into poems. I lost that notebook the night before I was supposed mm-hmm. to leave. So I was devastated. <laughs> I showed up at this artist residency now. I'd never done a retreat like this before. It was a huge luxury and privilege for me to to take that much time off from my job, from my family. I run an independent press and to take time away from that. And I'd put it all on hold and now I'm showing up and I have no clue what I'm going to write. And I sort of found my way into this and it, it, you know, lucky for me, there are these artists there who, who, you know, I guess we call them like armchair Kabbalists or some of them are Thelemites. And so, you know, we were having these conversations you know, in the evenings or in the mornings or whatever, when we weren't right creating. And I got really interested in maybe going back and exploring that vision that I had on DMT, except this time doing it in the longer form without the aid of pharmacognosis, <laughs> doing it self-generated through mystical visions. And that's what I set out to do. And then that's what I ended up doing. And I sort of, as a structure for the book, I thought about the Sephiroth of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life are divided into like the four material worlds. So it starts with earth, and then you have air above earth, and then you have water above air, and then you have fire as the fourth and final material world. And that's how the book is structured. And then I have a couple of interstitial sections for like the veil and the abyss and these shorter pieces, but the four long sections reflect the ascension through the four material worlds and kind of stripping away the body and then the ego and the consciousness as you make your way from earth until you're burned up in fire. And so writing that, I would spend a few days writing each material world or each interstitial. And for each one, I cultivated a series of kind of I call them somatic rituals to go with them. So for example, for earth to start with, I would spend that whole day walking around barefoot and like smoking tobacco and doing these different kind of contemplations and meditations to really absorb that vibration, that earthy vibration into my body, and then use that energy to charge my meditation and then my contemplation and the writing that came out and different things along the way. So, Yeah, I thought that was a pretty uh, intense sounding experience. And I got a question for you about that. Like, actually may tie back to the performance aspect of your work as well. But I'm curious, like, when you were either in those trance states, whether it was induced by psychedelics or otherwise, or when you're on stage or when you're in this performative ritualistic space, What does that look like to you? What does that feel like? Because I've mentioned this on the podcast at least once that I can remember of finding myself in this space where my eyes are closed and I'm literally just seeing geometric patterns and shapes 
and it was brought on during uh, sexual intercourse. So mm -hmm. it was a very intense, you know, sort of space yeah. there. And I've never experienced that before. And I've been able yeah. to experience it since again, but only in that same environment. So I'm curious if the space that I was inhabiting in those moments is similar to something like a DMT trip or yeah. a performance that you're just so sort of immersed in. Like, does this sound familiar at all? Yeah, well, yeah. And and when I was before when I was kind of talking about the the different ways to bring about mystical states, I I, I do think that sexual energy and is a tried and true method for it, you know, whether you're talking about tantric sex or sex magic or just like a really amazing sexual encounter that kind of shakes something loose and awakens something in you. I think that all of those, whether it's a psychedelic experience, a sexual experience, an aesthetic experience, they are varieties of mystical experience. And I think that there's overlap there, but that they are also there will be different distinct qualities to them. You know, there's a reason why visions had on DMT, they activate uh, and suppress certain elements of our brain. And so, you know, like in Dr. Strassman's book, DMT, the spirit molecule, I think he administered DMT to something like 200 patients and discovered this remarkable similarity in experience between all 200 subjects, right? That without consulting each other, that they would come back and give him these trip reports and they would sound like they had seen the same beings or had very similar experiences. And I think that that can be true also with other types of drugs or other types of meditation practices. And so in that way, it's actually really exciting that, you know, if you're a psychonaut, you can then explore those different things. And, and I think even Meditation is a is actually a really big blanket term because there are so many different ways to meditate. You can do kundalini meditation, you can do breath work, you can do visualizations, you can do mantras. And then within those mantras, you can do all sorts of different mantras. And I think that each one of those practices brings about a different type of mystical experience, a different quality to it. And in that sense, it's really fun to play around with them. But I think that one thing that you asked about, you know, in terms of my performance, what does that look like or feel like for me? For me, when I'm in that place, and whether that is a drug-induced place or a meditation-induced place or a performance-induced trance or like a, a profound sexual experience, is that what happens is the point of the action that's happening is each individual moment of its unfolding. And so I become, I become unattached from the outcome and free from this longing toward a certain endpoint. And I'm living in that in each moment, moment to moment as it unfolds. And to me, that's, that's the heart of the mystical experience. And that can come with different types of visuals, with different types of auditory stuff, different physical sensations. But whatever it is, you're living in those, in that immediate now, that immediate unfolding. Yeah, it's, yeah. I don't even know what to say in response to that because I'm sort of missing that experience right now. Or I'm not like missing it. I'm, I'm sort of longing like, for it. <laughs> yeah, longing for it. Yeah, good, good. Uh, yeah. Good word there. That's why you're the uh, published poet and I am not. So, you know, I am curious, though, to go back to sort of the Jewish mystical roots here of the work and of your life, I guess, and to go back to the, the tags that are associated with your work. You know, you mentioned Kabbalah and that influence that it's had on you. There's a tag here, this Ascension literature or this, and I don't know how to say this H word, so correct me if I'm wrong, but is it heck a lot? That's how I pronounce it. I was on a Jewish podcast where one of the hosts, she could pronounce it really well, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I say, I say heck, heck a lot, but I think it's like he a lot or some, you know. Something okay. Like yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what this heck a lot slash Ascension literature yeah. is and how it ties to Kabbalah and how it fits into your work. Yeah. So, so there are sort of two separate, but overlapping genres of Jewish mystical literature. And one is Merkaba literature and one is Hekelot literature. And Merkaba is the chariot of God. So that's the books of the chariot. And then 
heck a lot is the heavenly palaces. So together we kind of say the books of the chariot and heavenly palaces or something like that. And they describe slightly different things. So the the Merkaba stuff is really, it's like Ezekiel's vision where it's really just talking about this chariot of God with like flaming seraphim and wheels spinning in the sky and beings of light and stuff. And then the Hecalot literature is a little more about like, it's a little more of a hero's journey or a pilgrimage that is, and usually it comes with some sort of instructions of how to unlock and then move through the various heavenly palaces as you make your way kind of to Ein Sof and this unspeakable divine presence. But then the shorthand term for that, you could just say is like ascension literature. So that that's kind of the genre that I started to play with. And the interesting thing was I hadn't really read a lot of it, and I wasn't really familiar with the poetics of it before attempting this work. And what I had read was actually, frankly, pretty boring to me. There are some standout texts. I think Ezekiel's vision is pretty great. But for the most part, a lot of it felt rather legal and dry in terms of talking about the various preparations and the sort of esoteric mechanisms for combining and recombining the names of God or the names of angels in order to achieve your ascension. But then when it came to describing the experience itself, the texts fell really short, if they even attempted it at all. Oftentimes it would just, the rabbi or the mystic or whoever would say something to the effect of, oh, but it's indescribable. I can't talk about it. (laughs) You know, and then you're like, wow, you know, you got me all worked up and now, and then it's like, where's the money shot? So (laughs) I thought, (laughs) I thought, you know, I get it. It's indescribable. It's ineffable. That's the very nature of it. But what better way to attempt that than through poetry? Because poetry is a kind of speech that is able to convey something without actually being able to say it. That is what we do as poets. And so so I got really excited about this idea of being less concerned with a instructional magical text of saying like, well, you have to fast and then you have to do this and then you have to say the name 27 times and then you have to take this letter and carry the one or whatever. Sweep all that aside because I think you can get, it doesn't really matter how you get to the place that what I wanted to do was going back to what I was saying earlier, put myself into that state, capture that state as art and then convey that, convey the aesthetic experience to someone else so that they can find their way back into that state through the work. Because then you don't need to spend 20 years <laughs> learning all this crypto magic. And to me, that's the value of mysticism, I should say, is that it's non-hierarchical. Again, where I diverge from the Kabbalists is, you know, traditionally, women aren't supposed to study Kabbalah. No man under 40 is supposed to study Kabbalah. It is an occult knowledge. But I, I've been a spiritual anarchist <laughs> for quite a long time, and so I, I believe in a much more intuitive, direct form of approaching it. And to me, both that spiritual anarchy and this idea of poetry as a form of radical worship go hand in hand. And so on the one hand, it is in this tradition of Ascension literature, and I think on the other hand, it deviates from it. But that, again, is the heart of mysticism, that it has to always be made fresh and always be made new, or else it's not mystical, it's not personal, it's not non-hierarchical. It then becomes, it becomes the old guard. It becomes the structure that it set out to abolish. And I guess through that destruction, it renews it. Well, you mentioned the word radical in there, and I was curious what you meant by that exactly, because I think that it's fair to say that you see poetry as a radical act. Yeah. And I am curious, like, what that word actually means to you or, or what you mean when you describe poetry as as radical? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think about how to say it concisely. I think, you know, I guess I would call upon some greater thinkers than I. Susan Sontag has a quote about, she says, ordinary language is an accretion of lies. And in that sense, literature or poetry becomes a language of transgression. 
And if you think about that, ordinary language is, is the building blocks of our oppression. It's what we use. And when I say oppression, I mean both the oppressive in a very real way, a political oppression, a propaganda oppression, an oppression of hierarchy and patriarchy, but also an oppression of reality, <laughs> the system of reality. And so I think poetry then becomes this language of transgression, a way to rupture these systems and shatter that psychic oppression. And in that sense, I do see poetry as a, has a radical function. And uh, to take it a step further, that mystical texts or ecstatic poetry is an exceptional form of that because the mystical experience is, is magical and thurgical, that it conjures and it unifies. And so that when we talk about a mystical experience or a mystical poetry, we're experiencing that numinous other. And through that experience, it's an, it becomes an antidote to fundamentalism. And we're in, we're in really fundamentalist times right now. <laughs> so when we lose the self, we gain, this, we gain this knowledge of the other. And that feels really radical to me, the, this idea of social transformation through personal experience. Now, before we go here, man, I also want to point out, you used the word uh, phantasmagoria in the first poem. I always enjoy seeing that word in print or heard in conversation. And it's the only reason I'm mentioning it now, so I can just throw it on tape here. But uh, <laughs> I would like it if you'd share some of your poetry with us and, and get us into that performative state or get yourself into that performative state if you can. And I was wondering if, and I know it's kind of lengthy, but if you wouldn't mind reading that whole first poem, that first uh, sort of chapter, I guess, in this book. Yeah. Blessed is the lotus, the day's bleeding wound. Blessed are the spiders, their alphabet, 26 stones, my corpse is dancing. Blessed are the worms, the maggots, sexless and probing like tongues through the rotting soil. Blessed is the loam, blessed is the loam, the darkness, mushrooms, blooming teeth, pushing through the earth's black and putrid gums. Blessed is the maw, the great maw, the mouth, the gnashing of continental shores. Blessed are the stones, the rocks, the island, all the world, a promontory scab hardening around the earth's myriad molten wounds. Blessed is the blood, the bile ascending, the gross moss of shapeless years forming on the eyeless trunks of trees. Blessed are the snakes, the dragons breathing, the giants eating, each dumb beast, our mothers, our fathers filled with blood. Blessed are the black cricket's legs singing furiously until the whole lake is on fire. Blessed is the fire. Blessed is the lake. Blessed are the cricket's black legs. Blessed is the trembling nerve of now, the great topaz hurtling through galactic dark. Blessed is the dark, the knotted roots of the first tree, the fearful serpent uncoiling still as even the first stone turns to dust. Blessed is our fear, the great retching which rips us wide-eyed, hairy and blood-spattered, terribly laughing up from the mud. Blessed is the transfiguration of terror that wakens the crimson thread within. Blessed is our weaving and braiding, our crawling. Blessed is our climb. Blessed are we who flop from mud to soil to grass to trees. Blessed are our lungs, our hands. Blessed is the transmutation of air and fruit and meat to spirit. Blessed are the bees. Blessed is their hive returning through each flaw of rain, revealing the hierophany of nectar in the fresh light of the clouds, empty womb. Blessed is our moaning and shitting, our walking on quivering feet. 
Blessed is our walking and running, our speaking each day, our dying, our struggle toward freedom, our dying. Blessed is the fight for freedom even more than to be free. Blessed is our life. Blessed is our instrument responding with purity to the collapsing sigh of the world. Blessed is our cry, our cry, our radiant repeating, the gleaming cinder like honey, like wax, like roses, the world vanishing and nothing but us remaining beneath the abyss of God singing, I am the one that is not. And when the cry comes to no longer be the vessel, the cry comes not from your mouth alone. It is not you talking. It is ancestors of ancestors speaking with centuries upon centuries of mouths. It is not you alone desiring. It is a galaxy of descendants desiring down the long, fathomless pillar of your infinite heart. For between the void and the abyss, you alone struggle and are imperiled. And in your small earthen chest, one thing alone struggles and is imperiled. And when the cry comes, the cry comes in the crypt tongue to pass beyond my body bastion of sugar and bone my body monstrously shining above black lichen rivers its curse like a star of blood erupting from my throat a promise roaring jackals howling awful and grim my body my body lust magnificent views of Byzantium crucified awake in me and me among my body idle and brutal let light thunder the first to adore my body my ghost my retinue of ghouls profane and dancing dizzy drunk and shriek through a phantasmagoria of stars, my body exquisite thighs streaming with blood, my body hungry and gaping threaded with hands, my body my tongue distended and dangling amid corpses and non-corpses gung gung drone the bees, my body my mouth my penetrated mouth sing through the honeycomb locked in its jaws, my penetrated body levitating weightless, rotted by this leprous alien song. I am penetrated, I am penetrated, I am pierced. My body, my elephant, my chariot, I am pierced. I am penetrated by men, I am penetrated by insects, plants, and beasts, the ecstatic march of flesh. I am penetrated by birds, by stones, and the wind's twisted shell. I am penetrated by seas and fires, by colors, by wings, by horns, by claws, by constellations, butterflies. I am penetrated by great hemlocks blackening the moonless sky. I am penetrated by water, by dreams, by lightning cracks and mute night, by night by night thick as death it must be death. I am penetrated by death and cannot see. And beneath the night sky, the universe of every eye, judging acutely with their small fires, igniting to the orchard within me the path of names, every word along the way lit like a flame upon the wick of its origin. I kiss each name and make for it a temple on my tongue. I name a stone, I name an insect, I name an idea dancing across the dust moat's horizonless stage. 
I name a nightmare ecstasy. I name sleep a fertile wall of storms. I name the air choked with a blizzard of blossoms, white origin of apples buzzing on the wild, threadless sun. I name the eye of the earth blinking in my blood, a phenomena of swarms. I name the hour black lightning and its children golden sheaves of fire burning Lanka to the ground. I name this fever a flood like a harass of feral horses breaking on the blackened plain, and the trembling shale of stardust is its name, red java flower is its name, the sky lit by heaping nectar is its name, the cloud whose throne is a corpse is its name, dwell in its presence in dread is its name, reflect on the root from which you were hewn is its name, an act without knowledge is nothing is its name, the seven heavens of chaos is its name, Bilon is its name, Rakia is its name, Shehakim is its name, Zavul is its name, Ma'on is its name, Makun is its name, Erevot is its name, a curtain like the hum of a severed head is its name, the firmament scattered like a riddle is its name, the millstone grinding bright miracle of wheat is its name, a silver bridge of the dead returning to their infinite numinous source is its name, a choir of thousands terrifying slow and rising from a single mouth is its name, scorched by the awestruck jism of a new element is its name, amen amen as Salah is its name, there is a precise instant when and the world is marvelous. Now is its name. I hear its cry. I hear its cry, lacerated by a paradise of sadness, devoured by brutes. I hear its cry ashen with the incandescent dust of rubies. I hear its cry, I rise, weeping, a moth emerging from the innocence of limbo beneath the green bowers. I hear its cry dissolving in a golden beam. I invent new beasts. New flowers, new stars, new men, new holes, pool of Bethesda, new flesh, new tongues, new purity, oh purity, this vision of purity erect for the brief bliss of the void. With their pestilential breath abating, I leave the hazel copse. I depart through nameless, numberless years, climb the cosmic mountain parapets of jasper shining above the waning cypress, wading through thickets of mallow, I approach the navel of the earth. From the trunk of a gum tree, I fashion the sacred pole, anoint it, and climb belligerently ascend and climb. Further still, I climb and disappear into the sky. Oh, man, that was intense. So uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about what that means. Well, I mean, that's, that's the first material world. That's Earth. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, I don't know if it means anything other, <laughs> other than that. It's, you know, each section is an, a, is an attempt to really just capture a visceral experience of that stage of ascension. And so I start there and it's, 
it's carnal, it's physical, it's sexual, it's painful, it's, you know, it's all those things. It's all, it's all these things that it is to inhabit a body, I guess, and to inhabit a body in this world. And, uh, you know, and then at the end, it's like the first stepping off point. It's the first, that first moment of levitation where I'm not leaving my body yet. I don't leave my body yet for a few more chapters in the book, but I'm leaving the earth behind. And that's, that's that ascension into the disappearing into the sky at the end is the, is sort of the beginning of the ascension. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, Hey, tell people where they can keep up with you and your work, where they can find the book and if you have any performances online that they could check out as well. Yeah. So probably the, the best place to, if you want to find anything about me is just my website. It's my name, com. All my tour dates, the most up-to-date tour schedule is there. I'm doing about 30 to 35 dates around the country between now and the end of the year, including those seven really immersive Atlas Obscura events that I mentioned that are these bigger uh, rituals. I've done two already in New York and DC, but this fall I'm doing LA, Seattle, Chicago, Denver, and Philly. So if people want to catch those, it's a pretty wild experience. And some of them I'm doing with other live musicians as well. And then, you know, I'm on all the social medias. Uh, I'm not that active on Twitter, but I'm there. I'm probably most active on Instagram where I'm not only posting stuff from tour, but I like to post, I'm a book fetishist as well. So I like to post pictures of books. Um, and if people want to keep up with what I'm reading and maybe get some reading recs, I like to post stuff on Instagram as well. And then I've got a bunch of stuff on my website. You can get my book there. Of course, you can get it from Amazon, directly from Third Man. I have a, a very limited edition illustrated version of my book coming out with the UK publisher Folger Press. They're only doing 175 copies on like this really beautiful Italian paper. Those you can get at Folger's website. If people are familiar with them, they're publisher of the intersection of visual culture and magic. They're an amazing publisher. So I'm equally excited to have a, an edition out with them. But yeah, get it from Third Man, get it from your indie publisher. And you can also get it from my website. I sell signed copies from my website if that's your thing. So find me in the ether and in the world. Those are the best places to find people, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, Jonica Stuckey, man, thanks so much for the time. Really appreciate it. I hope to talk to you again soon. Hey, thanks, Ryan. I had a great time talking with you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Jonica Stuckey. What a performer and what a performance that was there at the end. And that's just audio. You should see some of his live in-person performances. Oh my word. You know, he mentioned that Atlas Obscura tour he's on now that will continue into the fall. Very limited dates. I'll link it in the show notes if you're interested. And I think I'm going to actually try to get to the show in either Chicago or Philadelphia. That seems like a nice reason to venture out of the Kingdom of Ohio for a couple of days. And do not underestimate the power of performance in your own life and the understanding or inner standing that it can bring to you. For the life of me, I can't find the article I was reading on the psychotherapeutic benefits of performance that I mentioned to Jonica during the chat, but from what I recall, the point of it was that by acting out a scenario that's been, uh, say, frustrating you, you act out a fictional version of that scenario and then study the sort of instinctual reactions you have to it, which, again, allows for a deeper understanding of yourself and how you process information and how you emotionally respond to it. Seems to work well with individuals, and it also seems to work well with couples. So next time someone calls you dramatic, you have an excuse. You're just trying to better understand yourself in the situation you are in. Wear that shit like a crown. Or maybe just save that for an intimate moment with your partner or your psychotherapist. And if you're an artist of any sort, let's not forget the understanding you can gain from your own work by performing it in some way. I'm sure any poet or musician or writer gains a tremendous amount of insight about a piece of art by reading it or playing it out loud or acting it out as if they were part of the work itself. Because these pieces, once created, they are now an entity in and of themselves, and what better way to understand them than to immerse yourself in them in such an emotive and visceral way. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, we talked about finding the show's mantra of love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority embedded into Jonica's poetry. 
which led into discussions about Jonica's spiritual anarchism, poetry as a form of protest, activism from a place of love versus activism from a place of anger, poetry as both theurgy and thaumaturgy, destruction of the self and ego death, Jonica's meditation experience where he turned into a mountain, and living in a pirate utopia. We also talked about being among a group of the first poets to take the stage at the Newport Folk Festival and meeting Jack White backstage. And maybe, possibly, we touched on Jack White's occult interests. And hey, my thanks to new patrons, Michelle, Scott, Tom, Michael, and Matt, and to returning patron Terrence. They joined the Patreon campaign recently, and you can too, at patreon.com slash occulture, where there's four levels of support that'll get you early access to all episodes, access to each extended episode, discounted merchandise, access to those full-length raw episodes you hear teasers for in the free feeds, a link to the show's Discord channel, which I rarely check, access to our After Dark patron-exclusive chats whenever I find time for those, and automatic entry into our monthly giveaways. There's still time to sign up for that Starboard giveaway, by the way, oculture at protonmail.com if you are interested. Anyway, I have some emotional drama to act out in hopes of better understanding myself and why I'm so fucked up. Talk about a uh, never-ending story, am I right? So until next time, you've just been initiated into Oculture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.